Welcome, everyone, to another episode of 10 Words or Less, in which I ask brief questions of interesting people and request brief answers in return. I'm Michael Prager, a speaker, lifestyle, and well being coach, and the author of two books, Fat Boy, Thin Man, and Sustainable You. Today's guest is Jeff Hazlett. He's a best selling author, a successful keynote speaker, and the host of TV and podcast shows on his creation, C Suite TV, and elsewhere. They'll be kicking off the programming year for the National Speaker Association's New England chapter September 17th, and I'll put ticket information in the blog post in case you'd like to come. Hope you will. Before we get started, I'd like to say two things. One is, uh, clearly, I have changed my studio for today. I am ensconced in an uh, uh, undisclosed location. And I, I'd also like to point out that it is absolutely before Labor Day and that allows me to wear this white jacket. The other thing is my typical 10 words admonishment to those of you playing at home. 10 words is a goal, not a limit, so please, no counting. It's not so easy, which is I like being on this side of the conversation. Now, Jeff, I always start my interviews with the same question, but today, I'm not going to do that. Obviously, one must begin with, what's Donald Trump like? <laughs> you know, what you see is what you get. That's less than 10 words, but that's indeed what you do see. He's a very good friend of mine. And, um, you know, I don't, uh, I think he's batshit crazy without question, but he's certainly doing what he likes to do. And that's, uh, you know, grab headlines and, and talk and get people talking. So if the one thing that comes out of this is the fact that we're all spending more time talking about the real issues in this country and the real issues that we face as Americans, then I think it's a pretty doggone good deal. Uh, but it will it yet to see. And by the way, I'll give Bernie Sanders credit as well, uh, because I think Bernie Sanders did a great deal on the Democratic side to raise the awareness. Here we were two years ago before the election. Now we're just 60 some days away from the election. But two years ago, we were in the middle of talking and talking in ways we never talked about before. And I think we owe it to those two people because of it. So the, one more thing I'll add, and this is a lot more than 10 words, so just get over it. You put the quarter in, you get to go for the full ride with me. <laughs> and uh, it, that I'll say there's two things I always tell people about it, because in fact, here's a magazine, an Israeli magazine that I'm in this week talking about Donald Trump and the, and the elections, uh, because they send them my way to talk about them because I know them personally, is, you know, look at everybody that's ever worked for him. They all work for him for some 30 some years. Almost every person I know that's in his organization has been there for decades. And you can't be an asshole and have somebody work for you for that long. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it, you know, it's even money, you know, regardless of the money, no one likes to put up with somebody that's just a real pain in the ass. And that that's one of the things you see he's in genuine union. You see him. He's a really nice guy. The other thing is of all the guys that should be screwed up, you know, when you look at his children, all the people that should be screwed up, you would think his children would be the most screwed up, and yet they're the most adjusted people I've ever seen in the world. Polite, nice, unbelievable. So he's got, you know, one, I think they got great mothers because there's multiple. Uh, but at the same time, I think he's been a very good dad, and I know how they speak of him, and that says something. I, I think that's a mark of a good person. So, right. you know, so say whatever you want about his politics. He's still, he's still pretty, you know, down home, he's still a pretty good person. I got it. Thanks for sharing that. So how did you get that gig anyway? You know, um, I came up with it when I was at Kodak. I reached out to uh, my team, reached out to him about doing celeb about doing the apprentice show. And at that time, we found out when I talked to him on the phone, I called him directly. I just picked up the phone and called him because um, you do that just because you can. And I called him and talked to him. Uh, it took me about 15 minutes to reach him. But uh, once I talked to him, I, I, we were talking about the show. And he said, well, we're not doing it. And then we came up with the idea of Celebrity Apprentice. And as a result of it, I was a judge on the show for three years. So you actually helped come up with the idea for Celebrity Apprentice with yeah. him? Yeah, and helped pay. Well, not with, with him. What happened was I called him. I said, this would be a great idea as part of the show as we were having our discussion. He said, you know what? You should call Mark Burnett and tell Mark Burnett that. And I said, well, I don't know Mark Burnett. He says, well, here's his cell phone number. Yeah. And I literally called Mark Burnett. And five minutes later, I was talking to Mark Burnett. And a month later, I was signing up to do the show and help to pay for it. Because I said, look, you guys do this show. We will be a sponsor of it because I knew the value of what that show was going to be. I could see it. I could see it. And I wanted to put my product in a place where we could disrupt the marketplace. And that's what we did. And so we used that TV show. So they used us. 
because we help pay for it. And, you know, being a lead brand at the time, I was chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak. But as a result of that, they could say, hey, Kodak's in, and they could go out and pick up the other seven sponsors. And, and so I knew, and I also know the power of that. So if I'm the first one in with a few million dollars, then the rest of people will also fall too, because they always need somebody to say yes first. And if you are the person in first, you typically get a better deal than everybody else. Good to know. Okay, so now here's my usual First question, uh, please spell your first and last name as you would like it to appear in the print version of this interview. Well, it's Jeffrey Hazlett, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, and Hazlett's H-A-Y-Z-L-E-T-T. -T. Great. Born, when and where, please be as specific as you will. I was born in Charleston, West Virginia, the Kanawha County Hospital, the banks of Kanawha River in West Virginia, on, um, on November the 11th, Veterans Day, 1960. Good. Now, now every every scammer in the world should have enough information to duplicate my personality and and steal my identity. So that's awesome. That's just awesome. I used to get the uh, Kanawha Valley TV. I went to uh, college at Ohio University. Oh wow! Yeah, there. Yeah. The Appalachians. Okay. Uh, regarding your birth, were there any unusual circumstances? Early, late? Uh, was Elvis uh, in the neighborhood? Yeah, not that I, other than I have a birthmark right here, that's about the only thing I know that was difficult about my birth. Okay, where do you live now? And my, and my mother was 20, and my father was 20 at the time. And I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I live in two places. I live in, in South Dakota. I live right outside of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I also live in New York City. We call New York home, but we call South Dakota home home because that's really where we'd love to be all the time. But unfortunately, or fortunately, because uh, it's both a, a blessing and a curse. The real business occurs in New York City. So I need to be in New York, which I love as well. So uh, with as much specificity, I don't want to pry too much. Uh, what's your family circumstance right now? Married, divorced, kids? Well, I've been married. Awesome. been married for 30-some years. I, I can't remember how many years it's been. Uh, 34 years and been engaged. And I was engaged for two years. We've been together for 36 years. I know me, I wouldn't be married to me. So I'm very happy. And, um, you know, and she's not as happy, but that's just the way it works. But we've been, uh, met her the first, very first night of, of college. And I got two children, um, uh, both a daughter and a son, daughter's older. They both work in the business and my son is married and we have a grandchild, uh, with he and his wife. Awesome. Thank you. So what's the first news event that made an impression on you? Oh, the first news event. That's a great question. You know, uh, probably watching at the time the landing of the moon with my mother. I remember that and that being a fairly big event. But, you know, I was always active in watching news and being involved from a young child. And, you know, I worked and I did, I sold, I sold the grit newspaper door to door. And so I used to read the grit newspaper, if you remember what that was. I sold subscriptions, I think it was 25 cents at the time. And so I was pretty involved, you know, and, and even in, in high school, I won a national scholarship uh, for current events because I, uh, from U.S. News and World Report, actually, and uh, the Shell Oil Corporation. So that was a, one of the big things I did in high school. Cool. Uh, what's a, uh, what was a favorite pursuit of yours growing up? Oh, hunting. It's always been hunting. Hunting, fishing, being anything outdoors, those are my always been great pursuits of mine. Uh, I, I, connecting to the outdoors has been one of the best thing that I've ever done and will continue to do all the rest of my life. Tell me some wisdom that you retain from uh, those pursuits that you carry into the rest of your life. You know, it, 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 grounds you to, it grounds you to the world and grounds you to the earth, and I think that's an important thing. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday who is a New Yorker, and he actually went hunting with his son in a, in a very remote uh, place in Pennsylvania. And he was talking about how he did it and how spiritual that was. And so that's one of the things that I've taken from that. It's the connection to us and the earth. I get that from hunting even more so than any other thing that I do. Excellent. That's enlightening. Thank you. So uh, I know part of what you do is you interview people. So when was the first time you asked questions of someone for the purpose of being able to tell others what you learned? Oh, it's probably from the womb or pretty close out of the womb. You know, I've been, you, and I've been one of those guys, you put the quarter in and you get to go for the full ride. I'm always inquisitive. I don't like a lot of small talk. I like to jump right into heavy conversation and heavy debate. And I've always been that way. And uh, from that, I create a lot of tension from that, but that I've always been known to speak my mind and be direct. And that's, that's come from the time 
that I was probably one or two years old. And I've always been that way. They, you know, my parents always, even though my dad was a very strict person in terms of he was an, an Air Force sergeant and that you had a certain role as a child in what you did, but he allowed me the ability uh, to sit at the table lots of times with men that were older than me and with women that were older than me. And my mother was the same way. And so, which I did the same thing with my children, you know, it's like little things just to give you an idea of like when we go on vacations with my child and they would turn to me and say, what would the kids like to eat? I don't know. Don't ask me, ask them. So that's the way they were with me as well. And as a result, you know, when, you know, my daughter was three or four, she would say, well, I, she would look at the menu, even though she can read it and say, I would like shrimp, you know, or whatever it might be, because I think that's in power. And I had that when I was young. Got it. So, uh, not to put you in a box or several boxes, but, uh, speaker, author, radio, TV host, which of those came first? Oh, uh, well the, the speaker did. I've always been a speaker. And, and, you know, I'm, I was a, put into the Speaking Hall of Fame here recently by the National Speakers Association, which is one of the greatest yeah. honors of my career. I've been in this, I've been in five or six Hall of Fames. I have to figure it out now in business Hall of Fames. And this was one of the most uh, dear to me because of the, one, because of the, the oration that I love to, to do, but two, because of some of the people that were before me, Art Linkweather, Ronald Reagan, uh, Norman Vincent Peale. I mean, these are just uh, luminaries beyond anything else. Brian Tracy, friends, of, and even friends of mine, Zig Ziglar, and many others. So that 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 in itself, and I think the ability to tell speakers, then you could do that in a book, and you could do that on TV, and you can do that on radio, you can do it in a podcast. And I think those of us who can and have that skill and that gift, because I think it's a it's a balance between the two, um, because you know you can teach anybody to be a speaker, you can't tell teach everybody to be a great storyteller. And, and I think that's a, that's a really, uh, it's a great gift that some people have. And I'm lucky to be able to drink that Kool-Aid and, and, and be able to do that. Well, uh, you know, I've been in five or six uh, halls of fame as well, uh, but I paid admission to them all. <laughs> well, you know what, you, no matter, no matter, even if they bestow you the honor, you, you paid a mission to get there. You know, I've been, in, I'm in the sales and marketing hall of fame. I'm in the direct marketing hall of fame, the quick printing hall of fame. British Printing Hall of Fame, you know, and, and, and the Business Marketing Hall of Fame. There we go. And, and the, the Speakers Hall of Fame. Those are the ones right there. Wow, that was, that was quick. But, you know, you pay a mission. You pay a price. You know, it's called hard work because it's freaking hard. And, and, the, and you're recognized for that. So no matter where you're at, you're always paying a mission for it. Got it. Well said. So if, which, if one of those had to go, speaker, author, radio, TV host, which would go first? Um, I would probably, uh, to me today would probably be the author piece because we're the, and then I look at that from a business perspective, which I'll do with the speakers group that I'll get together. I'm very, very focused on, I'm a marketer first and how you build and, and feed the audience and feed your, feed your community or some people would call tribe. And so I would probably have to say it would be the author piece first, even though that's one of the, you know, the written word is one of the things I like the most, but we're changing the medium in which we consume the information. And so if I had to pick one, my, I never give up the storytelling because, or the speaking, because the, you can always rely on that. But the, the, the avenues for me able to deliver those messages are becoming more around the radio, the podcast, and certainly video. So I wouldn't want to give that. But, but I'd also love, I love, and I love, and I love the power of the stage. Um, because I'm one of those, I am one of those speakers who uh, enjoys being in that spotlight, being on that spot on the on the stage and then controlling the audience and that, you know, and having the ability to take them up, take them down, have them quiet and then boom, hit them, you know, hit them with the hook. So, and all the little things that you learn as part of being a great speaker, um, that I would not, I would not want to give that up for anything in the world. Okay. Uh, what drives you? Oh, a lot of things drive me. I have lots of, I have numerous, you know, I call them conditions of satisfaction, you know, uh, paying bills drives me, things like that. You know, my wife drives me, my, you know, in, the inspiration drives me. I, but, but I talk about conditions of satisfaction. Look, for me, it's about uh, building wealth. 
for me and my family. So I can live in the lifestyle that I like to live in and I've come accustomed to. And to have a legacy and make it easier for my children and make it easier for my grandchildren and their children. I, I clearly am focused uh, in wanting to do that. That's one thing because that's, that's how we keep score. All right. And the other thing is I really like to learn. So I like to do things that I learn. And sometimes I turn jobs down because it doesn't interest me. You know, I've been offered daily talk shows on television, primetime, sh you know, primetime shows on big, big stations. And I've said, not interested because I got to do that crap every day. And that to me wasn't interesting. And, and so that's, that's another piece. So to learn is very cr critical for me. And the third would be uh, to have fun. I want to have fun with it. And, you know, it's, you know, I've had customers, I've had sponsors, I've had all kinds of people say, well, I want to work with you about this. Well, you know what? I don't like you. Um, I don't like your product or whatever it might be. So it's, it's got to be a good balance of those three. So those are, the, those are the three things that, you know, that are important to me. Good. Thank you. Um, let's talk, uh, tell me this. What practical takeaways will NSA, any members and guests realize if they come in here to speak? Well, that it's a driven process. I think more than anything else, I'll talk to you about how we had um, an idea to create a brand around Jeff Hazlett and that we left uh, a corporate job of, in a Fortune 100, one of the best jobs there are in the world, private plane, all the you know accoutrements with it. And I said, no, nope, we're going to go off and do this. And this is what we're going to do. Now, I'd been in the world before, so I knew what it was like. But I said, we're going to do it with this purpose and with this end goal. And, and so we'll show you how we plan that out. We'll show you what months are the most important months for us, how we would decide whether we do a speech for free or not, um, how would we, in order to gain something else out of it, and why we wouldn't do it in these three months, because those are the three busiest months of the year that we would have, and we're likelihood to replace it with good paid revenue. And how we utilize all of those things and develop systematic approaches to be able to drive the business of me. And that's the way we refer to it, as we call it the business of me. And so a lot of times our team, and I've got a whole team that's sitting over all over here, and they, they and I just got through meeting with uh, seven of them um, on our uh, what's our marketing plan and the agenda and all the things that we drive on there. And we'll, we'll, we're going to open that up. I'm going to show you uh, the pipeline. I'm going to show you how we rate things. I'm going to I'm going to answer any question and show you everything and anything that you would ever want to know about that side of the business. Great. Tell me a little known fact about the speaking business. You know, uh, the, I think the biggest mistake that people make as a speaker or as an author or thought leader, or whatever you want to call it, okay, is you don't know what you want. And you approach it in, in, a, in a, uh, a touchy-feely way or in a way that you don't really come to grips as to what you're driving. And so I tell people you have a choice. You can drive fame or you can drive fortune. Pick one. And most, most speakers that I know will say, oh, I want both. Well, can't have both. You can only have one. And I think most people focus on fame rather than fortune. I'm more about fortune. And here's why. Because if I build fortune, I'm going to do a good job and I'm going to be good at what I have to do in order to get that fortune. And if I do that, I can usually earn the fame. Okay? And if I can't, I'll have enough money to buy it. <laughs> Tell me this. You think Platform would have been a good name? Oh, call it what? For the name of NSA? Yeah. Call it dog shit. doesn't make a difference. I mean, it's all in the promise that we deliver. Uh, to me, the NSA, in terms of NSA as its name, doesn't mean anything. It only means something to the people in the organization, not to the people outside of it. And so, really, not, NSA is nothing more than a trade show or, tra excuse me, trade organization or professional organization for its members. That's what it is. It's not, a it's not even really a trade organization because trade's typically around um, a lobbying effort or some political movement. We don't have that. So it's really a professional organization of peers. So what's important for the members? You know, that's, that's what we try to take it as it's, it's got an, an entity that because we're an NSA member, we're more important. That's something we'd have to push a lot more to be able to do it now. And you're, and you're speaking to a guy that's been a member since like 1983 or 1986. So I've been a member for many, many long times. Because my belief is, is once, you know, that, that's my profession. So I should join. Okay. What you call it, I don't care. I, you may, it, to me, it just doesn't make a difference. It's about the people inside and what we do and why we do it than it is about the name. Okay. 
but I would have handled personally. I'm, I'm just since you put the quarter in, I'm again. I'm going to go for the whole thing. They should have handled a lot differently. They should have. You don't surprise people with stuff like that. You you take your time and you're methodic and you actually you beat them up in the head about it. You're going to make the change. You're going to make the change. You're going to make the change. And finally, everybody goes, "We hurry up already. Make the change." You know. And I think that was the shock value. Had the opposite effect, obviously. Okay. Uh, what is something that people don't get about the speaking business? That it's a business. <laughs> it's a business. You know, uh, you know, it's a business. That's it. Let's be very clear. You should be running it like a business. If you're not running it like a business, then you shouldn't be part of the professional speakers association. You shouldn't be part of that group. You should be part of like the Toastmasters. Go do Toastmasters. Go do something else and get the heck out of my business because I'm in the business of doing this professionally. Okay. What's something that you haven't already touched on that you love about the speaking business? Oh, that I love about I love the people. You know, look, it, and 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 the surprise surprises that some of them make real money is, that, you know, I do what I do, and I'm good at what I do for my audience, and I don't do some of that other stuff, and 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 it always surprises me that people can make money at what they do. I love it, and it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I'm not saying it in a negative way. I'm saying it in a very positive way because I just think it's very cool to watch people do what they do, and they're so passionate about it, and they get paid for it. So that's always surprises me. Always surprised me that somebody can wear a parrot, you know, wear a parrot on their shoulder, or you know, <laughs> dress up in a safari outfit, or whatever it might be. I mean, you, when we've seen them all, we've seen them all, and and I go, they get hired, awesome. Because if they get hired, I gotta get, I gotta be charged more, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and but more, but again, let me be very clear. More power to them, you know. I, you know, I in. Uh, let me just say one other thing I'd say is that, you know, people always think you got to do it this way. I, I think it's a great example. You can do it any way you want. doesn't mean it's going to be more successful, but it's going to be your way. And that's what I think is really cool about this part of the business is I do it my way. Cause you know, people come to me all the time and say, Jeff, you, you should do oh training. You should have courses. I don't, you know, okay. Yeah. Could I make some money doing that? Yeah. But you know what? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't have to do that. You know, <laughs> I'd rather do this. And that works for me, and that's cool. Okay. What's something you don't love about the speaking business? What do I don't love? Uh, I don't. I don't love the people who prey on the speakers um, to teach them how to do things, and they're just doing it for their benefit, not for the speaker's benefit. I don't like that. I think there's a lot of. I think there's a great deal of charlatans out there who take advantage of a lot of people, and they show them the mastermind techniques behind door number one. And you get behind door number one, and to teach you the next secret, you got to get behind door number two, and then door number three. And before you know it, you spent forty-five thousand dollars of your life savings, and you've gotten nowhere. And you know what? They could have spent um, five hundred dollars in NSA and gone to two meetings and got more out of it that way than they ever would have spent with all the gurus in the world. And I and I think they're better off doing that. That's what I don't like about the speaking business, that part of the speaking business. I just, I don't like those people. And, you know, be honest with you, if I say South Dakota, I like to punch them in the face, but I can't do that because that's politically incorrect. So I'll just do it you when I see anyone them. You just said that. What's that? Yeah, it's okay. I don't care. You can tell them I said, I don't mind. How is the speaking business different compared to when you started doing it? Oh, it's so much more sophisticated. You know, it is, I mean, think about it. We got CRM systems, we got marketing resource management systems, we've got websites, you know, when all we used to have is a speaker sheet and brochure and we all had pictures that look like this, <laughs> you know, and we've moved beyond that to, and, and by the way, that's also got some downsides to it because it also, you can't tell the good guys from the bad guys um, because there's also the, anybody can look like a million dollar brand. Anybody can look like a billion dollar brand uh, with the right kind of website and the right kind of editing and so forth. And, and so therefore you can't tell the good ones till you really get to see them. So, so, you know, that, that's, that's part of it. You can, you can make a lot of people who aren't as good look really good. And, you know, that, I think that's changed a lot. It's changed the, I think it's changed us a lot. How will it be different by the time you start being in the speaking business? I think we'll come back around. I, I think that, you know, I, Brian Tracy and I were having a discussion about this, that, you know, the what I would call us old schoolers, because I kind of got gray hair in, in a little bit and have been around that, that, you know, circuit for a while. 
I think it's it's starting to. I think we're going to start to see that sage wisdom come back. I think we've got a lot of people who are you know doing the TED talks and the TEDx talks and those kind of thing and thinking that's the business. That's not the business. That's the business of the free business. That you know, but that professional, that professional keynote or that subject matter expert, that motivational pe- person, all those different stratas that we have, I think is going to come back even more because as we get more digital, we also become less personalized. And I still think we need that, that, that touch. You know, one of the things a lot of speakers say, well, I don't want people having my videos out. You know, I've never, by the way, that's one of the good things about all the digital is I've never lost a speech because someone saw me online. And, 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 and I think that, that, that helps us, but, and I think we're going to see that come back around. Tell me someone who deserves more attention. Who some you mean in the speaking business or just overall? Just answer it however you want. My family deserves more attention. I, I, I put them on the back burner many times, and I shouldn't be doing that. I get that, and I apologize. I should have asked you, name someone outside your immediate family. Oh, okay. Well, well then, then it's the rest of my team because I need to be spending – no, seriously. You know, you, you, we tend to ignore the things that are closest to us and go to the next shiny object when we should spend a lot more time – focusing on how can I help you do your job better or how can I help you do this, which in the end benefits me anyway. But we, we tend to do the other things and we, we tend to r- run to the shiny object rather than taking care of the things that are around us. Okay. I'm going to ask that question better the next time I ask it. That's okay. It was good. It was a, no one died. <laughs> Something <laughs> about you that would surprise other people. I was struck by lightning. Wow. Yeah, and lived. And I've almost been struck by lightning numerous times, but I literally was struck by lightning in 2001. I used to be magnetic personality. I, now I'm electrifying. That's what I said. <laughs> you weren't walking around with a golf That made the team laugh over there. The team's laughing over there. That or they're laughing at something else we did. Yeah. Uh, something that surprises you about others. Uh, that they'll, they'll never stop surprising you. Just when I think I know something or know them, then they surprise me. Okay. And it, by in a way, in a good and a bad way. In a so good and a bad way. You that you're a little sheepish about. Sheepish about? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that that I'm not too sheepish. I, I I'm not I'm not very sheepish. I'm not very sheepish about most things. I it, it's oh man. What would I say? I really I don't have an answer for that because you know what I'm pretty out front on anything you know I go to the dentist when the dent like I was at the dentist this morning the dentist starts asking me questions that I don't want to answer I said I'm not answering those questions those are for your benefit not mine so please ex- move on <laughs> you know right. I'm not I'm I'm pretty direct I just I'm tired of living my life where I I'm not All right. and yeah I got I got too many more years on this earth and I want to use every bit of it I can and you know and people taking up my time with bad stuff means like I, I get to eat less bacon and drink less scotch and I don't like that <laughs> um, a question I should have asked you oh I have no idea what, what would you want to ask me I, I have no idea that's well, I don't know ask you all the ones I could think of well not all of them I had to respect your time as well but uh, that often yields some uh, to make sure I didn't leave out something that uh, you know, I you know, if it's from a speaking perspective in terms of speakers, um, you know, the the question I guess for the group that you know we're going to be coming up and see why would you why would you why would you come see it or why wouldn't you I guess would be the other thing I would ask I, you know, a lot of people talk about NSA and I think that one of the greatest organizations that I've seen that's helped my career has been National Speakers Association. And because every time I go, even look, I've been in this profession for 30 some years and you'd think I know everything. I don't know everything. And I always come away and Terry Paulson is a great speaker, former national speakers association president used to give a speech about keepers. Maybe Terry still does that speech about keepers, but he'd always ask at the end of the convention when he, when he was a leadership, what were your keepers? And you know, every time I go to a convention, I don't go to every session. In fact, most of the times I never even go in and listen to most of the big keynotes. But I sit outside in the hallway and I run into people and I talk to them and I get really great keepers. And and I think that's one of the best things that I've always learned. And you have and so, you know, why wouldn't you come 
to the NSA? Let me tell you why you wouldn't, because you're such an egotistical bastard or idiot, and you think you know everything, and you're really that stupid. That's why you wouldn't want to come, because you know it all. And I, and I found out that one of the greatest things is you don't know it all, and that's one of the greatest things. So, you know, even my team say, why would you go to a chapter and speak? Are you kidding me? I'm going to come away with something. I'm going to give everything else, but somebody's going to have a twist on that little piece, on that little piece, and that's going to make the difference for me for the weekend. So that's cool. Awesome. You know, I uh, uh, Terry did one of these interviews uh, previously. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm an admirer as well. Um, what I found in, in NSA is that it would seem, or some might think, that we're all in competition with building a bigger pie rather than dividing it up into uh, smaller pieces. But it's extraordinary to me how giving the people I've met in the uh, organization have been. I've not experienced that uh, in too many other places. Uh, an example of that is you're giving me a half an hour of your time. I appreciate it very much. I will uh, send this out. Uh, it's on my blog already. It'll be on YouTube. Uh, but in addition, I will uh, take some of the clips and we'll send them out to our membership. And anybody else who wants to come uh, on September 17th, uh, everyone is welcome. And I am convinced it'll be worthwhile, it'll be entertaining, and you'll be glad you came. Well, thank uh, you very much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate, appreciate joining you for a few minutes. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, God bless you, and uh, have a good day. Have a great Labor Day weekend. I'm going to have a great one. I'm looking forward to it. All righty. Talk to you later. All right. Cheers.